Two weeks ago, I made a short little video where I attempted to find the statistically best character in the game Super Mario Party. It was a lot of fun to make, and you all seemed to really like it, but I did make one pretty glaring mistake. Uh, no, it wasn't an error with the math or the simulation or even when I accidentally bashed Hammer Bros kneecaps in. No, rather, I mistakenly assumed that you weren't real gamers. I thought I could get away with cutting a few corners. I thought I could oversimplify the simulation so I didn't have to write a million lines of code. I thought I could turn it into a fun little learning exercise about the power of expected values and nobody would notice. But I see now that you are a higher caliber of viewer. You demand a higher level of accuracy in your simulations of inconsequential party games. You demand full statistical rigor for your tier list constructions. And you're apparently a huge fan of Daisy. Neato! Last time, I defined the best character in Mario Party as, generally, the one who could move the most spaces. After all, if you can move further in a turn, you're more likely to reach a star, which is the whole point of the game. And that revealed that characters with high expected die values like Bowser, Boo, and Wario tended to perform much better than characters with lower values like Daisy and Hammer Bro, who were the worst. However, as many of you argued, this method ignored one key factor. Consistency. A character like Daisy might be the literal definition of mid, but she is reliably mid. Sure, her special die may not move very far, but if you're in a situation where you're only two spaces away from a star, she's guaranteed to get you there. In this same situation, Bowser only has a 50-50 shot of getting that star. Uh, sure, most of the time, Daisy's die isn't all that helpful. It's more of a tool, only to be used in the right circumstances to guarantee success. And in a game that's almost entirely pure luck, one guarantee can be a very powerful thing. So, was I wrong? Did Daisy get snubbed? There's only one way to find out. This is another full statistical analysis of Super Mario Party. Richard, hit that intro. For those who haven't seen the last episode, you probably should to understand all the changes we're making this time, but in essence, last time I wrote a program that would simulate a few hundred thousand games of Mario Party by basically rolling each character's special die a set number of times and recording the total number of spaces they moved and the number of coins they gained or lost. While it was able to give us some useful data on character averages and movement capabilities, it didn't account for the actual board state at all. In reality, it wasn't really simulating a game of Mario Party, it was more simulating a riveting game of rolling numbers and adding them together. WHOA! So, let's fix it. The first thing you need in a game of Mario Party is players. I'm not going to do another full simulation for every character and player combination. That would take way too long. So instead, we're going to take four key players, throw them into the great crucible of battle, and force them to duke it out in a few thousand games of Mario Party to see who reigns supreme. Four will enter, only one will leave. So, let's meet those four lucky players. For this experiment, since we're primarily interested in seeing how important consistency is, obviously, Daisy's gonna be our first player. Her die features 
four threes and two fours for an average value of 3.33, slightly lower than that of a regular six-sided die. If you want to go at least three spaces to nab a star, Daisy's guaranteed to get you there. And she also has a two-thirds chance of rolling exactly a three, which can be pretty helpful if you want to land on a specific space. The next combatant is Shy Guy, who offers a different kind of consistency than Daisy. Instead of guaranteeing that you move at least a certain number of spaces, Shy Guy specializes in landing on exactly one space. He's got one zero, and all the rest are fours. So, if you happen to be four spaces away from a really good space, Shy Guy will either land you on that exact space, or not move you anywhere and give you another chance next time. Third, let's throw in Bowser, the character who's able to move the most, but very inconsistently. This will help us determine how important consistency is compared to raw movement. And finally, for our fourth player, I'm proud to present the newest addition to the Mario Party cast, Steve. He's the guy who didn't realize you could swap your dice and has just been rolling the regular one this whole time. He's, uh, yeah, he's just the control group. You kind of need one for a good science experiment. I'll be honest, this guy's gonna get slaughtered. So, now that we have our players, it's time for the hard part. How are we gonna simulate an entire game of Mario Party with just some basic code in a timely manner? Well, the simple answer is, we're not! Trying to account for every single feature and little complexity in this game would probably make my computer explode if my brain hasn't already from trying to figure out how to code all that. Instead, we're going to simulate a very simplified version of the game that keeps the core mechanics intact. First of all, we're ignoring coins completely. They're annoying to track. Stars are only 10 coins in this game and they throw coins at you even if you lose a mini game. If you can't manage to scrounge up 10 by the time you reach a star, I'll be honest, it doesn't really matter who you pick, you're a lost cause. We're also not including shops or items since they benefit everyone equally and wouldn't affect the end result anyway. Players will be moving around a simplified board that's 32 spaces long, about the same length as Womp's Ruins without any of the branching paths. At the start of the game, one of these spaces will be replaced by a star, and just like in the game, whenever someone reaches the star, they'll get a point and the star will move to a new space. Since we aren't using coins, we don't have to worry about distinguishing between red and blue spaces, but there is one more mechanic unique to this game that I do want to try to include. Allies. If you land on a specific space, you can gain a random ally from the unchosen characters. Once you have an ally, their special die is added to your pool of possible dice, and Whenever you roll, your ally gets to roll a little bonus die that's either one or two. You can have up to four allies in a game, which means that you can theoretically get a plus eight to any roll you make. Pretty significant. At the start of each game, we'll select a random space on the board to be an ally space. Whenever a character lands on it, they'll get a random ally from the unselected characters and all the benefits that go along with them. So, that's the whole board set up, now it's time for the hard part. We need to define the character AI. I know I said the last part was the hard part, but this one's actually way, way worse. Because Daisy and Shy Guy's dice are only useful in certain circumstances, we need a way to define what those circumstances are and when they should use them. We also have multiple things that characters might want to accomplish. Stars get you points that ultimately determine who wins the game, so obviously they're very important. But trying to target an ally space gives you a passive bonus for the rest of the game, which could help you to get even more stars in the future. So here's what I've set up for this simulation. 
During the first half of the game, the player's first priority will be to land on an ally space. The program will look at each die at their disposal, calculate which one has the highest chance of landing on the ally space, accounting for any bonus from allies they already have, and then roll that die and move that many spaces. If there's no ally space within range for them, their second priority is to reach a star, choosing the die that gives them the best chance of reaching or passing the space with the star. If they can do neither, they'll just roll the die that gives them the best chance of moving as far as possible. In the second half of the game, these priorities will switch. They'll first prioritize stars and then getting more allies. The earlier you get an ally, the more turns you have to benefit from their added effect. But if you go out of your way to get one in the last two turns, it might not actually have a chance to actually affect anything, and you would have been better off just trying to get another star. At the start of each game, a random turn order will be selected, the star and ally space will randomly generate, and then players will take turns rolling dice according to their current priorities. The program will track how many stars each player was able to obtain, how many allies they got and who those allies were, and how many total spaces they moved over the course of the game, to give us some data to analyze at the end. To get a good sample size that won't take several solar lifetimes to calculate, I've simulated 1,000 10 turn games, 1,000 15 turn games, and 1,000 20 turn games. I then compiled all that data into a spreadsheet, which you can find in the description down below. The only thing left is for the battle to begin. There's not actually any graphics or anything for this simulation. I don't know why I said that, like you were about to see something sick happen. So, after all that, what's the answer? Is consistency the secret key to victory? Did I do Daisy dirty in my initial tier list? Is Shy Guy the secret dark horse of Super Mario Party? No. No, they're actually, they're not that good. Across all 3,000 games, our basic boy Steve won 20.93% of the time, Daisy won 22.27% of the time, Shy Guy won 23.17%, and Bowser still reigned supreme at a win rate of 33.63%. Dividing the data up based on game length, we see that there's not any significant change to these values or rankings in longer or shorter games. No matter how you slice it, Big Bow is the way to go. Unless you slice it to factor in coins. So, what happened to the power of consistency? Why does the character with a 50% chance to do literally nothing dominate so much? I mean, he's not even Luigi. Well, I think the reason is twofold. First, while consistency can be beneficial in certain circumstances, it's only helpful if you randomly get into that circumstance. In order for Shy Guy to be able to guarantee himself an ally, he first needs to randomly land on a space exactly four spaces away. So you're not really improving your odds all that much, you're kind of just kicking the can down the road. The same applies for Daisy. Sure, if you happen to fall two spaces short of the star, she's great. If you were playing as Bowser, you probably wouldn't have fallen two spaces short to begin with. The second issue is with allies. On the surface, allies seem to be insanely broken. They give you more options of dice to better improve your odds in the future, and they give you a passive bonus for the rest of the game. It seems like characters who can reliably nab an ally early on should absolutely dominate. And to be fair, in most games, that's probably true. But with the specific characters we chose for this simulation, allies didn't actually help all that much. Across all 3,000 games, Bowser only got 1,162 allies, Steve got 1,354, Shy Guy got 1,539, and Daisy got 1,632. 
So the more consistent characters were able to get allies significantly more often than Bowser or even the Control, showing that they are effective at landing on specific spaces. And yet, in the end, they barely seem to make a difference. Why? Well, first of all, Bowser's base die is so insane that he's basically his own ally. The expected value of a standard die, which remember is better than Shy Guy and Daisy, is 3.5. Adding in a free 1 or 2 from an ally brings that up to 5. Pretty good, but also only slightly better than Bowser's base die, without any allies at 4.7. On average, you're sacrificing 1.3 spaces early on in the game for potentially 0.3 more spaces later. In a 10 turn game, you need to get an ally in the first two turns to make up that ground. Another problem with allies is that they inherently introduce more randomness. At the start of the game, Shy Guy can only roll a zero or a four. Nice and reliable. But the moment you get one ally, you have a chance to get a one, two, a five, or a six. Throwing in a second ally and you could get a two, three, four, six, seven, or eight. The more allies you get, the less consistent these dies become and are therefore less effective tools in your belt. You're putting in all this work to effectively get to Bowser's starting point. All told in this specific simulation, allies only improved a character's odds of winning by 2 to 4%. Again, this is likely because Bowser is so dominant that anyone else getting just one ally probably doesn't matter. Although, I was able to find that the ally with the highest win rate was Luigi. By like a weirdly high margin. I actually have no idea why, why this happened. It feels like it shouldn't matter all that much. But hey, I guess it's Luigi time. Now, to be fair, this simulation isn't perfect. There are loads of different types of spaces that you may or may not want to land on. For instance, I didn't include any bad spaces that you might want to specifically avoid. It made the AI logic way too complicated, though to be fair, Bowser might actually be better at avoiding spaces than Daisy or Shy Guy, because there's almost no overlap between his two dice. Unless the bad space is right in front of you, you can choose a specific die to guarantee that you pass any bad luck spaces in your path. And I do want to reiterate, Daisy and Shy Guy are by no means bad characters. This simulation shows that they were able to reliably get more allies, and as a result, performed better than Steve the Standard Guy, who on paper has a better die for movement. So yes, my first tier list probably needs an update. These consistent characters aren't nearly as bad as I first thought, but in the end, it's still not enough to stand up to the might of the Koopa King. In the immortal words of Jack Black, your Tyranian belt buckle is improperly bejeweled. Yeah, that, that, was, that was Bowser, right? That, that seems like, I mean, Mario might have worn a belt at some point that he could roast. I don't know, that seems like, yeah, 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 no, I'm right. So uh, there you have it, gamers. A more nuanced analysis of Super Mario Party for your more nuanced palette. So go forth with this new knowledge and dominate every game of Super Mario Party that you probably won't play anymore. I mean, there's been two new Mario Party games since then, and they totally got rid of the character dice system, so literally none of this is relevant anymore, but, uh... Huh. Yeah, maybe I shouldn't have devoted two weeks of my life to learning to code for this. And a massive thank you to all my patrons, including Alakazam, Aspa102, Big Dog Tie for the Win, Sidian, Gremlin the Goblin, Sherry and Mark, Starjoy, The Boss Killer 94, and Captain Kirby.